Hi, I'm going to go ahead and start it so I can make sure I make maximum use of my time. Um, I think I'm the last session uh, of the whole conference, so I'll consider it a closing keynote. But I know I'm also up against Andy Allen, who's pretty awesome too. But you can't leave here to go see him. Um, so, um, so I'll try and keep it energetic and exciting. Um, if I do go too quickly, I have been known to do that. They are recording it, so you can play it back later at half speed. Um, I will get excited, and I will speak very, very quickly. So what I wanted to talk about and share are a number of different projects that we're doing. Um, so I've been involved with OpenStreetMap since about 2006. Um, and then about three years ago, um, I joined Esri um, with GYQ to work on how to make open data, open source, web collaboration part of the tool set uh, of the way ArcGIS works, the way Esri works, and then really as a platform for how we engage and help government customers and different users get their data and join communities like this one. So I want to share kind of some of those projects. So OpenStreetMap, at its core, is a global open data project, which is amazing. It's probably by far the largest, most active global open data project. And speaking myself as someone who is an independent consultant and worked for a startup and now works for a bigger company, it's amazing to see the transition talking with governments around their own ideas around crowdsourcing and citizen engagement around data and data authoritativeness. A number of years ago, if you'd asked them, can citizens come and correct your data, they would have said, nope, nope, we have the best, highest quality data. Now it's, well, we have smaller budgets, fewer people, and we trust that people can actually give us better data. So that alone has proved the viability of citizens correcting data and then open share itself as a data source they want to engage with in multiple different ways. And it's also demonstrated how it's not, while it's the data and the data is the highest value, it's also about the collaboration and those feedback flows. It's about how people engage with one another and putting data in and taking data out and using it in more meaningful ways. A few years ago, we'd have conversations here about tags, tag formats, and database structures. But now, as you saw with Dale and others, it's all about how it's being used. And so we're really interested in how do we make the data more usable so then people are encouraged to want to correct it and improve it over time. I think of this in terms of life cycles and, and ecosystems, about how things are fed and grow over time and then feed back into that ecosystem. And things like in this case, and, and maybe to carry an analogy a little bit far, is the idea that open is very good at measuring the observable, the mountains, the air, the trees. It's able to measure the rain, even some of those temporal things. But what's very difficult to do is, is gather the data that it can't see, in this case, the ocean. So the ocean, when you often look at it, is just a big, flat plain. It looks very boring. There's not much going on. But anyone who's done any kind of marine biology or marine science knows there's an amazing wealth of, of life and biodiversity and energy that's going on underneath that ocean. But you can't see it, so you don't know how to access it. You can't breathe the water, so you can't get to it. I kind of look at that analogy similarly with government data. It's all this amazing data that's teeming with life and energy and things we rely on, but we're not really sure how to access it. So the question becomes is how do we make it part of that ecosystem? How do we evaporate it out and make it accessible so people can do things with it and do all the observable, measurable improvements and uh, applications we want to build with that government data? Perhaps more apt is thinking about this as, as the new kind of infrastructure. Government often invests in things like parks and roads and police as a way to build communities and have businesses grow and be viable. Digital information and data are this new public square. They're this new investment they make as just a public good by which then businesses can build up where communities can gather and convene together. And that happens to be digital information, digital data at this point. Not everyone's going to use the raw street, but the street enables the business to build so people can engage with the business. This great quote uh, was from actually from CityStat. So those of us who believe in the progressive power of accurate data believe that we can use information to strengthen our connections to one another. Though these connections, we have the potential to change the course of city's history, a state's history, a country's history, perhaps even our planet's history, parcel by parcel, neighborhood by neighborhood, and most importantly, neighbor by neighbor. So it's these people behind the scenes that are actually working, powering the data that want to engage with it. The question is they're also very, very busy people that have some of these amazing data. And the question is how to make it very easy for them to engage and share that data. We'll engage with them as map geeks just as much as we're map, map geeks here. And there are many more government uh, staff people and, and data providers who are showing up here. But how to make it even easier for them to engage? Because we want to make this data accessible and explorable. As a mapping company, we're very excited about making the data explorable in different ways. We have a project called the Urban Observatory. We've taken open data and allowed people to compare at the same map scale and the same thematic representation, different cities in different ways, to see what does this data mean? What is the traffic of Jakarta compared to London compared to uh, Los Angeles, or the urban density, or the elderly population, and compare those together? Because this data is available globally. There's governments globally. 
and I can speak in one thing that I'm excited from Esri is we work with 23,000 governments already that use our tools to manage the data in terms of how they build roads. So the challenge was how can we make it easy for them to make their data openly and accessible? So we actually give them a new tool we launched last year called ArcGIS Data that allows them to literally click a button and the data come out in a number of different formats and tools and launch their own open data portals. So since we launched this last year, we've had uh, over 2,000 government agencies launch 1,000 sites in 26 languages that are sharing out their local data. So these are local cities, counties, regions, states, countries, federal agencies, both in the US and abroad, that are able to now publish out their data from their source in easy to use formats. And it's interesting when we actually bring these things together and we federate that data and make it easily searchable from one location. So with 27,000 data sets, we now have a tool that allows people to go and explore this data and this information in easy ways. Hopefully this plays. Oh. My video's not playing. Oh well. So people can go and explore and discover data about roads in the US, roads in Kenya, um, from any of the government agencies. So that's great. So all this data is out there and available and searchable. Okay, it is going. So I can search this data find it, and kind of a standard open data portal interface. But this is only just, just the beginning of that capability. So when you, when you go and find it and you find your geographic area, you might want to download it in different formats. You're downloading it now in a shapefile or KML or, or um, GeoJSON. So that's great. But what we've also found often with this, and probably if you've ever run into this, is the question becomes immediately, can I use this data? So you found some great data somewhere. Can I use it? I think this is one of the big cruxes of where we're stopped with open data and how it now this comes into OpenStreetMap and the ability to use this government data in OpenStreetMap. And Randy Meech actually pushed this out as one of the challenges currently um, for, for the community. Because when you go and find this data, you're lucky if you can find a, a license uh, for it. And if you're really lucky, it's something like this. It's public domain data. That's awesome. So population housing data um, available from the state of Washington. Public domain, pull into OpenStreetMap, go crazy. But that's not always that simple. Often you go and find some really complex legalese around indemnification, uh, a lack of use or, or types of use, formats, contact info, things like that. Very verbose, you have to pour through it every time. Or often it's empty or things like this. The license actually just, here's where it came from. And you don't even know what you can do with it. So that's kind of a challenge here is, is you want to use this data, you don't know how you can use it without contacting them and having to do that every single time. So the point of what I'm, tr I'm trying to talk about here is, the, is how do we treat our licenses like we do our data? APIs and tools like JSON made it very easy for us now to share our data in structured ways and schemas via the web. And we're very interested in doing the same thing with licenses so we know what we're looking at and what we can do with that in a structured way. So what we're building into this tool and, and, and providing for governments and we're really interested in feedback from the community is how do we actually make it easy as possible for governments to choose licenses and actually help them make that decision? So we're actually providing user interfaces that allow them to choose from a set of well-known licenses and hopefully encourage them, kind of like an upsell, but hey, Creative Commons is really awesome. You should really choose that one. But if you don't hear other licenses too, and help them along the way knowing what is the impact to their local community or to business opportunity by the licenses they choose. So first, is thinking a lot about this user experience around how people choose a license. And once they select one, we're then going to provide it out in markup via JSON. So this is based on the SPDX uh, JSON format, which is what the Node Package Manager also uses. So if someone's using the API, you can now go query any data set and find out what licenses is it under, Creative Commons, uh, ODBL, share like public domain. But then more interestingly enough is what are the capabilities of this license? Often a lot of licenses will still be unique. They'll be written by a lawyer, they'll have custom content uh, and, and phrasing. And we still want them to indicate and tell us and tell you what are you allowed to do with this data? So if you have a lot of indemnifications around it, if you have a lot of protections around it, in the end it still just means attribution pleased, but com commercial use is allowed, you can, don't have to share the derivatives, you can do whatever you want with it. Essentially compatible things like OpenStreetMap. So we really want to make this possible for agencies to choose, once they wrap it up, what people are allowed to do with that and then make it very, very clear. And then build into our and then anybody's interface when people are searching for data, when they're searching for where it's from and what theme it is and what category it is from government agencies, they can also choose what are the capabilities of the licenses of the data they want. So give me all of the road data in southern Africa that allows for only uh, attribution-based restrictions. Or give me all of the school data in Central America that allows that. 
So it actually is a core aspect of the way we search for and use information. And we've been seeing that kind of validated here. This was an example where there was a, a local citizen in Chesapeake, Virginia, that went to their local open data portal, found some data uh, around buildings. So they found all the building outlines. Uh, Chesapeake had very little data around building outlines at that um, location at that time. He went and found them, found them in their ArcGIS open data site, downloaded them, um, exported them, and then he wrote up a number of scripts, worked local government in terms of how to import them, and push them all in, and now if you go to Chesapeake and OpenStreetMap, they have extremely good parcel uh, data and addressing data. So it's a really great way to take this government data that the government was trying to share out and pull that into OpenStreetMap. And you can even see here another kind of high level view of the quality as well as the tags that were maintained as it went into, into OpenStreetMap and the full change set history around that. So it's people like this, the, the local developer, the local GIS uh, enthusiast, the citizen that wants to get data to help put an open shrimp or even do validation that wants access to this data but wants to make sure what they're getting and how they're getting it, that it can be used for projects like this. So I also want to share kind of what we're doing with that then is what does this enable then? Why are we publishing all this data and making it as easy as possible to get into OpenStreetMap? We recently did an evaluation uh, in a number across the world about comparing OpenStreetMap to commercial providers to figure out for ourselves what we wanted to use in our base maps that we publish out for free. We com compared a number of cities. So we compared um, Tunis, uh, Tunisia with OpenStreetMap on the left. Um, this is after we've, we've uh, pulled it in and, and rendered out tiles compared to a commercial provider. And in this one case, the actual overall roads were fine, but it was missing, the commercial data provider was missing things like buildings, addresses in this case, other park data that was actually a higher quality in OpenStreetMap. So we chose to go with OpenStreetMap here. In Tripoli, Libya, Libya much higher quality in OpenStreetMap than the commercial providers. Juba Sedan, and so on. And there have been a number of these cases where we found higher and higher quality in these areas that commercial providers were less interested in mapping because maybe there's less of a commercial market but very high quality data in OpenStreetMap that we could use and also then help encourage governments to get their data out there and improve it locally as well. So this is a rough, rough overview for us in terms of our base maps, what we've pulled in from OpenStreetMap. Where we've, where we've, most of Central and Northern Africa is now entirely powered by OpenStreetMap. Um, a lot of the islands of Indonesia are all powered now by OpenStreetMap um, data. The road centerline data, tree points, land use polygons, really high quality data. So now even us as a company, we're very interested in making the data high quality as well as government users and citizens being able to improve that data as well. We also build an open source and an editor for OpenStreetMap in our tools. So the several million ArcGIS users out there can go and download this tool from GitHub, open it up and download data from OpenStreetMap, build maps and, and, and thematic views and cartographic views of this, but more importantly, they can actually edit the data and push it back in with their OpenStreetMap account as change sets back into the database. So really interested should encourage people who can go and find this data that want to use ArcGIS to do this and contribute with people that are using JOSIM or ID or any of the editors out there. So if you're interested, you can go to GitHub, Esri, and there's an ArcGIS OSM editor there. And there's been a lot of other interesting use cases where we've seen this had a, had a really big impact. We were heavily involved in the uh, World Health Organization's Ebola response. And we went and analyzed and looked at when we're doing summary analyses um, of the, uh, the data and the impact as we went through and used a story map to actually share out essentially the daily reports through an interactive display. Um, as we zoomed in to the areas, we started using that high quality, up-to-date OpenStreetMap data. So as you look at things like response areas and shelters and, um, and impacted populations, it was using OpenStreetMap at its uh, lowest level or, or highest precision data. And even more so is being able to do routing along that in these emergent situations. So we also worked with them to actually build a, a routing tool on top of that so people that wanted to need to get access to labs to do testing and evaluation could go through a simple web interface, click and do routing um, across the OpenStreetMap data and then visualize that to where, where they needed to go. So it's the, it's the power here of not just using OpenStreetMap for as a base map or a way to see a map, but a way to actually do analysis and access. And one last project I want to share with you that we're working on that we think might be helpful here is a project called Coop. Coop is something kind of born out of our desire to work with as many different web APIs as possible. Think of, the, think of where out there uh, tools like Flickr, ArcGIS, uh, Mapsend, different tools have different APIs, different HTTP calls, different JSON formats. 
Koopa is an open source node JavaScript tool that allows you to convert between any of them. And so we actually built one that now talks to OpenStreetMap and, and makes OpenStreetMap available via GeoJSON, as as we feature services, even as vector tiles. So now you can tie into things like, give me all of the pubs from OpenStreetMap in, uh, in Manhattan and throw that at GeoJSON.io, for example. Or you can go and take that because it offers out as a feature service. You can now pull that into tools like ArcGIS Online, copy and paste that URL, and then you get all the same tools for visualization and uh, analysis, buffers, drive times, uh, spatial correlation, being powered by OpenStreetMap data, but now able to be used in a GIS and compared with other data. And it's talking, talking to that same database. So what we see here is wanting to really help do what we can to help round out this ecosystem, about connecting out the millions of people who do GIS every day, who manage the data that, that we want to get access to, to have them actively participate in the community using tools they want or leveraging the data that you're helping gather and then make, make more useful tools out there. Because often it's, it's a race to, uh, to get to the ball to play the game. It can be fun. And we really want to make encourage people to participate and play along. So thank you for everyone for, for everything you do. Um, and I'm available for any questions. And the slides are, huh, comes back up are all available when the, this comes back up. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? If, 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 yeah. I'm big fan of P3. OK, I'm big fan of P3. Okay. Of P3. So in ArcMap, you will create new deep processing tool uh, arc map for uh, grid map. If you use special data analysis, then uh, they publish using IT table to create work mapping. So if, uh, you're saying in ArcMap, if you use the, um, do you want to publish that out? They will publish using IT table. P publish your ArcGIS server. Create web map application in ArcMap. If you, if you uh, uh, create your create uh, open grid map layer if you use spatial data like buffer overlay proximity if you take all file uh, public you can actually able to get web mapping you right. can actually online right yes yeah, so you can publish it all to online to web mapping application right then to create web app builder a lot of information web app builder for us here Web app builder. The web app builder, right. So yeah, what he's talking about is uh, we have something called web app builder, which is a free tool you can build full on, like that routing engine um, application I showed you from WHO. You can use our free web app builder to build an application powered by both the OpenStreetMap database as well as the OpenStreetMap spatial data and analysis tools. Right. Hey, first try. Oh, you lost it. Hi. Um, have you thought about trying to uh, simplify the process of submitting data um, from your open data portal back into OpenStreetMap directly? Yes. So the question is, um, have we thought about simplifying the process about how to take data from our open data portal into OpenStreetMap directly? Um, yes. But where that gets difficult is, um, you know, we don't want, we could, ease, we could very easily add a button import into OpenStreetMap, log in with your account, boom, we push it all in. But that's essentially now a bulk import, right? With, um, the question becomes, what's the, how much, so that would be the simplest, but would probably not abide by the overall community guidelines for you know, stomping over data, uh, normal you know, um, conflation, um, and getting them in there and, and getting the data in there in a, uh, an appropriate way. The question is, is then, how do you, what's the next level above that that is going to impose a little bit more effort but isn't so hard as having to go to a whole other tool, right? Um, but I mean, something we're really interested in, in talking with the community about, and that's kind of why I'm here sharing this, is what we're doing, is the first pass is just, here's the data. It's, it's puppets out of the water, and now it's, a, it's available, and hopefully you know what license it is, right? The question now becomes is, how do we make it as easy as possible to push that data into OpenStreetMap? Is it selecting individual features and saying, okay, push this feature into OpenStreetMap, and you can go through one by one and kind of push them through the map into OpenStreetMap that way? Um, is it by selecting out areas and saying, okay, now again, open in JOSM or open in ID, open the editor of your choice 
and then doing that and walking through that workflow because you have the tools there to do it. Um, really interested in what that is. Um, really interested also is, is uh, taking any of the diffs from OpenStream up itself, the change sets that happen, and actually putting that back into the, into the comment stream, back to the data provider, here's where all the edits are. And I think if as much as possible we can get the data providers aware of how much activity is going on in the community, whether it's a little or hopefully a lot, the more likely they're going to engage with that community as well and actually open up and get into a dialogue around it. So um, those are a couple of things we're thinking about there between the change sets back and forth as well as the possibility to push it back in. Um, but want to make sure we do it appropriately and we're introducing these people. Um, in the end, it's not just that their data goes in. It's now there's you know, 23,000 government agencies who are now members of the OpenStreetMap community working daily to make sure the data is of high, high enough quality, maintain quality in OpenStreetMap as possible. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much. I hope you had a great conference, and I'm sure I'll see you at the Statue of Liberty. Thank you.